I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Lars Chitka. Lars is a professor of sensory and behavioral ecology and the founder of the Research Center for Psychology at Queen Mary University of London. He directs the Bee Sensory and Behavioral Ecology Lab and is author of The Mind of a Bee, which we'll be talking about today. Lars, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Hi there. It's nice to meet you and I look forward to our conversation. What got you motivated to study bees? How far back does this go? Um, it goes back to 1987. And um, it's a chance um, sort of sequence of events, as I guess with many such things. So I um, started studying biology at the University of Göttingen in uh, West, was then West Germany, and got um, it's a good university, but a, a very boring small town. So I had this idea to move to the pre-university of West Berlin. Uh, and West Berlin at the time was an island in the middle of East Germany, surrounded by a wall. And um, so I asked a professor in Göttingen what he thought of this idea. And, uh, and he um, immediately said, well, that's a really terrible idea. It's a... Um, career suicide, the university does nothing but plan revolutions and so on. And then he scratched his head a little bit and said, I think there's one good lab working on bees. And um, I had been interested in animal behavior before, but not necessarily bees. But I thought in my youth club to Ms. Martin, one lab's good enough for me. I'll move to West Berlin. And so I did. He was right. That was the one good group. Um, in the biology department, so that's uh, that's how I got how I got into bees. But um, once I actually took a, a look into a beehive, I guess lots of people would just uh, see a, a box full of insects as if these were cockroaches. But it immediately struck me that I was looking into some sort of alien civilization. Like you could immediately see. The construction activities, lots of in different individuals doing different things, all kinds of interactions and communication events going on. So I was immediately hooked then. So it's intelligence. Well, the, the intelligence isn't immediately apparent from just looking at the uh, behaviors that you see inside a colony. For that, you have to confront bees with, I guess, various tasks in which you ask them to learn things or come up with solutions to previously unknown problems, and then measure their, their efficiency with which they do that. And, yep. of course, people have looked at bee colonies for millennia. Humans have been fascinated by them since the the advent of our species, largely initially as a as a deliverers of the the sweetest energy drinks that were to be had in wild nature, but also they were ever in many parts of the world as as deities. But people haven't been immediately struck by their intelligence because that is something that you only explore once you do experiments, of course. Now, at least in psychology, for a long time, behaviorism was dominant. And then in the 70s, 80s, or maybe a little before then, you have the cognitive revolution and people start thinking more about the mind in computational terms. And does that only apply to humans or around the same time where you seeing this cognitive shift towards it's not just behavior of a bee we're studying, but they have minds? Yeah, that's an, there's an interesting history to this. Um, I was taught in the 80s that we were um, witnessing a revolution in those regards, um, both in, in humans as well as animals, where people became increasingly interested in their inner lives, their cognitive abilities, and so on. The truth is that, of course, clever thoughts have often been thought by clever people before. And it turns out one of my big heroes whose work I only 
became aware of in recent years is one Charles Turner, an, an African-American, who was active in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And he fought against impossible odds, of course, at the time he found it difficult because of his ethnicity to secure a job at a research university. This guy published over 70 papers, very visionary work on animal intelligence, um, mostly on insects, but some work also on bird brains and um, behavior of snakes and so on, and was pretty much diametrically opposed to the, um, the Thorndikes and Pavlovs and so on of the time in that he explicitly highlighted cases of cognition in insects, for example, that could not be explained by trial and error learning, but had to involve some sort of insight and problem-solving skills. He discussed the possibility of free will and emotions in insects and other animals and so on. And his work was, of course, forgotten or all but forgotten for all the wrong reasons. But the work is out there. It was published around the turn of the, the 19th to the 20th century. And so had people listened more, then there wouldn't have been a need for a cognitive revolution in, in the 80s or 70s. Um, so, yes, the body of work has very greatly increased in recent decades, but I think we might have seen something like that in the history of the exploration of how brains work and function much earlier had people listened to the right scholars. You know, I'm generally very liberal with my ideas of what I call consciousness or intelligence across species. You know, some people say that consciousness is limited to humans or to cortex. I think, I mean, even bees seem very conscious and very complex. But emotions, what I know about emotions and being generated in limbic brain structures, which we share across mammals and, and maybe some reptiles, but not necessarily invertebrates. What does emotion look like in an invertebrate? Or what is, what is the case for arguing that they do indeed have emotion? Well, so, I mean, I think before we go into the details of that question, I think we need to zoom out a little bit and be honest about the fact that this is a difficult question. It's difficult in that in any species other than the human, these questions can only be addressed not by formal scientific certainty, but by probabilities. And so the problem, of course, is that we, we can't talk to animals. We can't ask them, how do you feel? Um, and we can do that easily in, in humans. But the difficulty is apparent, I think, when we consider current debates about whether, artif whether or at which point artificial intelligence systems can be um, said to have emotions. And the question is obviously a tricky one. There's not a single proof where everyone would say, aha, now we've shown it. Um, it's even a difficult question in non-language gifted humans. So um, if you consider that up until the 80s, 90s even, in many countries, surgeries were performed on newborns and infants without anesthesia because doctors would say circumcision, for example. Doctors would say that, um, um, well, yeah, sure, they scream and kick and so on, but they, they actually have no consciousness. They don't feel anything. And so despite the evidence pointing in the opposite direction from all the overt behavioral responses, doctors dismissed them then as just reflex-like behavior without any kind of the emotional component of unpleasantness. And so that's the difficulty we face with, with animals. And in the past, of course, scholars like Descartes famously dismissed not just consciousness in general, but also the, the, the question of sentience or emotions in, in animals entirely. 
and um, and uh, dismissed or basically classed animals as machine-like things that were programmed to deliver certain behaviors in certain conditions, but which actually neither thought nor felt anything. That's a long introduction, just saying that the question is going to be difficult. Um, and indeed, probably 20, 30 years ago, I would have regarded it as, as unanswerable or, or indeed downright laughable for bees, for example. What changed my mind? So we um, did some experiments 15 years ago um, where we explored the question of whether bees can learn about predation threat. And specifically, there are uh, so-called crab spiders that are cryptic on flowers. They hide themselves by adapting to the color of the flowers on which they, they sit so they can turn yellow or white, uh, they, like a chameleon. Some species can also turn pink. And they just wait there and jump at uh, unassuming pollinators that visit the flowers. And we were just interested in the question of whether bees could learn to avoid these spiders. So we took the whole setting into a lab, built what we called our robotic crab spiders. And... They were basically life-sized models with um, solenoid-driven pincer mechanisms that could briefly capture a bee and then release it. But these were two sponge pads, so the bees were not injured in any way. They were just held for about a second and, and then, then released again. And we then measured their responses and uh, their ability to learn to avoid these spider-infested flowers. And... They learned to do that just fine, perhaps unsurprisingly. So with experience, they um, were got better and better at um, avoiding flowers with spiders. But first of all, their whole demeanor changed. So the bees would subsequently scan every flower very carefully before deciding whether to land, even days after such predation attacks or simul simulated predation attacks. But the most striking phenomenon were the false alarms, were the visits where the bees scanned very carefully the target, even if it was safe, and then rejected it. And so they, they were, they seemed visibly nervous, um, um, changed their whole flight behavior. But the, the most peculiar phenomenon for us was that they, behaved as if they were seeing ghosts. That is, they, they would scan perfectly safe flowers and then go, this doesn't look quite right to me, and reject the flower, which had valuable nutrition. And in this case, of course, the perception of there being a threat was just conjured up from memory. There was no threat actually currently there. And this, at least superficially, and I'm deliberately saying this, um, flippantly, but um, it looked to us a bit like a post-traumatic stress disorder, as one might see it in, in humans, where you respond to threats that are actually not, not currently there. But of course, it's not a formal diagnosis of um, an anxiety-like state. It just points in that direction. I've now, heard evolutionary arguments that it's you're not necessarily selected to perceive the world as it is. There's going to be a sort of neurotic hedging or increased threat sensitivity because, say, you see rustling in a bush. Is it a snake? Probably not. But if you presume it's not a snake and it actually is and you die, you're not going to leave your genes behind. If it's not a snake, but you act as though it is and you avoid it and go the long way around it just for precaution, those more cautious more threat sensitive individuals over long periods of time, those genes might win out. Does that sound right? Yes, it does sound right. I mean, I guess the key question is does all of this involve just pre programmed responses where you hear a rustle and you um, just um, step back a bit and, and go in a wide circle around that bush? Or does it have to be, does it have to involve some sort of emotion-like sense that you're going, 
um, slightly on alert. You're getting slightly nervous um, and, and looking around much, much more carefully and so on. And of course, the, the idea that there is a dichotomy um, between humans and other animals there would, would, in, would um, imply that what involves a, a sort of conscious awareness and an emotion in us is somehow fully automated in all other animals. And, and that doesn't necessarily seem plausible to me. But again, I should highlight that this is just one study and a single such study, you can always come up with some sort of mechanistic explanation that does not involve emotions. And so what we and others are doing instead to explore this in animals, including in bees, is to look at multiple lines of evidence. And the approach there is, everyone knows there isn't a single definitive proof for emotion-like states in animals. So what we do instead is we look at multiple psychological paradigms. People look at hormones, they look at neurophysiological states, um, at learning and memory, and so on and add all of this up. And if all the evidence points in the same direction, then at least you can build a reasonable case to say, okay, most likely with a, with a relatively high level of certainty that animal has emotion-like states. So if you have a bit of time, I can give you a few more examples that we've been exploring. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So... The spider experiment wasn't actually designed to explore emotion-like states. It just um, had this as a kind of um, byproduct that popped out of what we found, but we didn't set out to explore it. But one way in which um, animal psychologists more formally explore emotion-like states are so-called so -called cognitive bias tests, where you face an animal with a variation of the proverbial glass that's either half full or half empty. So you have an ambiguous stimulus in the human proverbial case, a glass that's half filled with liquid. And to some individuals in an optimism-like state, um, they would go, oh, it's pretty good. There's still a lot in there and be quite content. Whereas another individual who is in a more pessimism-like state um, might respond to exactly the same stimulus going, oh, it's already almost all gone and be all sad about it. And various versions of this, um, this paradigm have been adapted to the animal world, to laboratory rats, but also domestic animals to see whether they're kept in conditions conducive to their, their well-being or not, as the case may be. And the um, way in which we did this with, with bees was that we trained them to uh, respond to two colors, for example, blue and green. And they learned whenever blue was shown, there's always a reward. Whenever green is shown, there's never a reward. They learned this after a few trials quite well. And because there's only ever one stimulus present, they, we can measure their um, delay with which they accept these, these stimuli. And it turns out once they've learned that blue is good, they always fly there straight at the moment when they see it, straight line fly to that target. We show them green, they go like, oh, I already know this is not rewarding. So they'll divver around for, for minutes. And then if nothing else is offered to them, they might finally land there and, and get no reward as before. Once we've trained them, we show them the ambiguous stimulus, turquoise. And that's now our glass 50% filled. And we're asking, okay, this has a bit of a, a bad part. It has a bit of a good part. It's exactly in the middle. How does this look to you? And it turns out that this depends on what happened to the bees before they even entered the setup. If we give the bees a little surprise reward, just a tiny drop of sugar or water where they hadn't um, expected it, they respond to this turquoise, the ambiguous stimulus, with much greater enthusiasm than they otherwise would. So they treat it more as if it's a good thing than if 
um, than a control group that hadn't received this reward. It turns out that this um, more positive response to the ambiguous stimulus is also dopamine dependent as it is in us. So they get a little dopamine hit from that surprise reward and then go, once they're seeing this um, novel um, ambiguous stimulus, ah, this could actually be quite likely rewarding and then visit that stimulus. You can also shift response in the opposite direction. So uh, Geraldine Wright from Oxford University has given the bees a surprise predator attack before they judged an ambiguous stimulus. And then the response shifts in the opposite direction. They meet it with greater hesitation. And so at least in this case, by the same criteria that people use in rodents and domestic animals such as sheep and goats and so on, the, the bees also respond to ambiguous stimuli with these cognitive biases, depending on what happened to them before the, um, the, the, the judgment of the ambiguous stimuli. There are a few more things that we did, um, both with um, positive as well as with negative emotion-like states. One is the question of whether bees feel pain. And um, so that's obviously a, a negative emotion-like state, and it has to be distinguished from basic nociception. The, where nociception is just a more reflex-like um, detection and then behavioral response to an adverse stimulus that is, is potentially or actually damaging. And of course, you can generate such responses by a simple reflex loop that do not involve any kind of ouch-like pain, just a simple circuit from, let's say, your, your extremities um, and the receptors in them back to some motor command that makes you withdraw the, the, your, your, let's say, hand from a, from a heat, hot plate does not necessarily have to involve some subjective unpleasant experience. And a hallmark of actual pain experience is, is flexibility. So humans can, to some extent, um, self-medicate with, um, endogen with their endogenous opioid system, which means that sometimes when we're in situations of danger, in a, let's say soldiers injured in the battlefield often don't notice injuries right away until they're brought back to safety. And in a more, um, well, day-to-day -day version of this you might have experienced um, a you might have gone on a nice hike on on the weekend and um, come back to the mountain cottage and someone points at your knee and says oh that's a nasty graze and you look and indeed there is a graze and once you become aware of it it hurts so it's this kind of plasticity that um that that um is is a characteristic of pain and that is demonstrably not a kind of reflex loop because otherwise you'd turn off as have noticed right away and acted accordingly. And so we explored in bumblebees with um, using moderate heat, so not, not injurious heat, but we gave them a variety of flower types, which could be heated to the extent that, well, to um, temperature of, um, of 65 degrees Celsius, which is unpleasant, but it's actually colder than your Starbucks coffee. So um, it's not an injurious heat. And we gave the bees a choice. Do you want to go to a heated flower and get your reward and uh, or to an unheated one? If the rewards were equal, the bees clearly responded with a sort of expected reflex loop. They tried these hot flowers a few times. But, bah, I'm not going there. Just chose the um, the cooler nectar. If, on the other hand, the heated flowers had better nectar rewards, the bees basically learned to grit their teeth and, and uh, suppress their normal withdrawal response and um, collected the, the nectar from the, the heated flowers, artificial flowers, nonetheless. And again, while this single experiment isn't a formal de demonstration of the flexibility that comes with pain in humans, it's at least consistent with it. There are also other lines of investigation from um, the integration of nociceptive pathways with 
other sensory pathways in the brain. The, um, there are more lines of investigation for looking at this kind of flexibility, but there are at least multiple indicators that point to the capacity of having pain in a way that goes beyond basic nociception. You've also written about personality-like individual differences in bees. So in both of these tasks, where you're showing them the color, and you mentioned that depending on whether they're rewarded or threatened before the task, that can change behavior. And I'm sure that's like a, a whole cohort effect where you're looking at many bees and on average you find this effect. Do you also see individual differences where some from the get-go are seem to be more reward sensitive or more threat sensitive? Yes. So for, for any psychological trait that you measure, you do see variation between individuals. And indeed, such variation is often consistent from day to day. So when you look at the same individuals repeatedly in either similar or related settings, you find that they typically tend to behave similarly, similarly across days. And so that relates to things like learning speed, where let's say we train bees across tasks for, um, well, associating either colors or scents or patterns with rewards. You find that individuals that are good in one task tend to be also better in other tasks. And with many of the more complex tasks, such as string pulling or puzzle box opening, we often have a few sort of genius bees that solve a task in manners that we hadn't even anticipated. But these consistent individual differences also relate to things like neophilia and neophobia. As you said, so the responses to um, novel stimuli are either perceived consistently by individuals as threatening or potentially more as interesting. What beekeepers have observed already in the past, of course, is that colonies also appear to have, um, let's say, individually different individual differences from colony, one colony to another in terms of aggression levels and uh, abilities to harvest food. But of course, these colonies are made up of individuals that actually carry these traits. And so there is often also a heritable component to these differences where you find a colony signature because colonies, of course, are families of related individuals. And indeed, you can, you can breed selectively colonies for certain traits that you can then subsequently measure in individuals and see how such traits um, translate across generations. In human studies, when looking at the heritability of different personality traits, often we'll use twin study designs where you're comparing, say, identical and fraternal twins, which are more or less raised in the same environment, but one group shares more genes than the other. And often you find that to the extent something is heritable, the identical twins are more similar than not. So do twins exist in insects? Is there a way that you can have clones and compare clones to something like ordinary genetic siblings to non-related members of the same colony? Mm -hmm. So we don't have clonal bees, but there are certain ant species that um, are indeed clones. So they're really genetically identical. People have done fascinating work in such ants, for example, on the, the um, influence of experience on task specialization. So insect colonies often impress us with their sophisticated division of labor, where certain individuals engage in, in construction of um, the nest, others in, in uh, looking after the brood, yet others engage in nest defense and other specialists foraged for the various commodities that are needed in the, the colony. And um, often people assume that these things are rigid, that, um, that they are the result of genetic differences, or that individuals by a sort of fixed developmental program cycle through these various tasks according to life stage. And there's um, evidence for these things in, in some insects, but of course, one way to rigorously test such things, as you say, is in individuals that are genetically identical. And 
So in these clonal radar ants, for example, people have done studies where they um, let all the individuals get some experience with foraging, but they stacked the odds so that some individuals would be less successful and others would be really successful at, um, at collecting food for the colony. And so they have this positive experience of, hey, I'm actually good at bringing stuff back to the colony, whereas others didn't. And it turn, turns out that the um, individuals that had this averse experience of going out, investing time into searching food and found nothing, were much more likely to switch back to tasks inside the colony. And so they evaluated their own success and then adjusted their specialization according to how good they perceived themselves to be at a particular task. So very interesting findings. Um, in honeybees, of course, while um, there aren't clonal bees, but there are no genetic differences between queens and workers. And so the fate of an egg and the question of whether that egg later turns into um, a queen or a worker is also entirely environmentally determined, in this case by the diet that these bees are fed when they're larvae. So the, the, the larvae that are destined to be queens later on are fed a different diet, the so-called gelé royal, that um, prolongs their life by a factor of, um, well, 10 or so. Um, it um, results in a completely different lifestyle, morphology, um, including the morphology of the brain, the sensory apparatus in the queens compared to the workers. Does that mean that in a lab setting, if you give enough female larva the royal jelly, that you could have an, an arbitrary number of queens produced? You could in theory. Um, people have done these experiments, not in lab settings, but with, with bee colonies for for a long time, but simply um, moving the eggs around between cells that are destined for workers and those that are destined for queens. So the, the workers, in a sense, take the lead because they do all the construction ability and they build basically three types of cells. One, uh, well, two of them are, are hexagonal shaped. And um, these are the ones that are used for workers and uh, male bees. And a third type looks a bit like a peanut, which is much larger and attached um, uh, in different locations on the comb. And these are, these are um, used for queen rearing cells. And what you can do, of course, is simply move eggs that have been placed in worker cells into these peanut shaped queen cells and vice versa. And it turns out that what the workers do is simply they go by not what by what what's in not by the by the by the egg but by the uh, the shape of the wax structure, and they uh, put the special diet this designer diet called Gelé Royal only in the peanut shaped cells for the queens, and the other diet the more basic diet into the uh, worker cells. And so if you switch the eggs around, you get the predicted fate. You get a worker egg that is put in a queen cell, turns into a queen and vice versa. What's adaptive about having only one queen in a colony who reproduces? Well, so you might ask that. It seems in a sense surprising and in opposition to the basic notion of Darwinian fitness, where you would postulate that every individual tries to um, maximize its, its own genetic output. In the hymenopteran insects, that is, the, the bees, the wasps, and the ants, odds are a little different because the relatedness be between workers, between each other, and also the workers and the queen, this relatedness is higher than in most other animals. 
And this is because of a um, peculiarity called haplodiploidy, where the um, workers and queens have two sets of chromosomes in the same way as we do, whereas the males have only one. So males are generated from unfertilized eggs from the queen. So she just puts, um, well, her contribution to an egg, but there is no father. So this in turn means that if you do the maths of how the uh, relatedness then um, arises in the, the worker offspring is that they're all much more related to each other than our typical human siblings or those of other animals with a normal diploid pathway. And so this means that in terms of evolutionary fitness, workers have more to gain from raising more sisters rather than having their own offspring. And so in essence, the whole colony works together. They, there's a strong selective pressure because of this high level of relatedness to help each other. All the colony works together like a single organism in a sense to maximize the, the output of that single reproductively active individual, the queen. And also, of course, um, at the, the peak of the, um, the abundance of foraging resources to bud colonies by generating swarms and also producing males. So that is the, the way in which fitness is produced. The workers are off getting nectar and building the hive. What do the male drones do other than reproduce? Nothing. Um, so they are perfectly useless in a honeybee colony, at least, where um, they are really not much more than, than flying penises. They can't even feed themselves. They, they have to be fed by the workers and do not engage in any foraging for the colony. They don't engage in colony defense. They're stingless, in fact. And um, um, they also don't uh, participate in construction or um, any kind of maintenance of the brood. Their sole function is, is mating. That's not the same necessarily in all species of bees. In bumblebees, for example, the, the males can at least forage for themselves. So they visit flowers and they're therefore important pollinators. But they do not, again, typically contribute to any uh, thing that could be legitimately called work in the colony. In bumblebees, there are, there, 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 there are a few exceptions where people have observed males engaging in warming the brood. So there, there might be a few cases there where the, the males actually do something useful, but not in honeybees. What percent of the colonies are male? Again, it depends on um, the species. In honeybees, there are typically a few 10,000 workers, but just a few um, hundreds of, of male bees. So in mammals, there's often these pheromonal triggers for reproductive success. So uh, especially if it's uh, some, some primates do this, where if they have an alpha male, and he's the only one allowed to reproduce. While an alpha male is present, even juvenile males who are old enough to re reproduce, the, the hormonal cascade doesn't happen, and they don't become sexually mature unless the alpha dies or is removed, and then someone new can become sexually mature. Now, do you see something similar with the queen bee preventing maybe chemically anyone else from either producing that uh, jelly royale or being allowed to mature into a queen? Yeah, I think it's um, interesting that, of course, we are taught to perceive bee colonies as perfect examples of natural harmony in society, but there is, in fact, quite a bit of competition going on. So, indeed, yes, honeybee queens suppress the reproduction of workers um, deliberately by the spread of a, of a pheromone. And 
this is it's especially interesting in bumblebees to observe the um the societal processes once the queen becomes older and weaker because at some point actually her um ability to suppress reproduction of worker wanes and uh in bumblebees more than in honeybees the the workers are then able to to reproduce and so as the queen becomes weaker several um, of the larger workers might actually start laying their own eggs and because they don't typically mate these eggs are unfertilized but they can of course have their own individual fitness to through producing males but before the queen dies she still tries to um to um retain her dominance by eating worker laid eggs by attacking these workers physically and sometimes there'll be counterattacks from the workers so there is quite a descent descent into anarchy at the later stages of the um the colony development and workers then also the egg laying workers attack each other and uh, try to i guess seek dominance of the colony to some extent but they can never become queens because typically they don't have the structure for example to retain sperm so they can just um for a few weeks while the colony deteriorates at the end of the reproductive season um spend their time laying worker laying unfertilized eggs that turn into to males i have a weird question about sex in bees and we've laid the groundwork for it already so knowing that bees have some capacity for emotion and there are neurotransmitters like dopamine that we know work similarly in humans and other animals, and there's a subjective sense of pleasure or reward in chasing those dopamine outputs, and knowing that male bees die after they successfully reproduce. So one way of spinning it would just be this is all reflexive, adaptive behavior. Um, there's no subjective benefit in it for the male bee, but they just do it because this is what they evolved to do. And the other thought would be something like it's almost equivalent to dying in an overdose, like with certain opiates or other drugs that work through dopamine. It can kill you, but it can also be, it can hijack your brain's pleasure center. Is there any? work on dopamine or mating in bees to show that they're it's actually so rewarding for them that it's worth death it's a very good question um so you're right in honeybees again not necessarily other uh bee species the males actually die at the end of the copulation because their penis is ripped from from their bodies and then of course they basically bleed to death but in honeybees or any other insect for that matter, I don't think anyone has explored whether there is a pleasure component to um, copulation. Of course, there's another story from uh, insect mating behavior in praying mantids where, where um, the females sometimes consume the, the male, and that's been cited as evidence that. Um, there's no pain-like behavior in these males. But of course, the exact opposite might be the case. That is that because of the pleasure, any kind of pain-like response is actually suppressed. And so people simply haven't looked at it. But it's also interesting if you observe, let's say, a bumblebee copulation, which often goes on for an hour. There seems to be a lot of, um, sorry, this sounds slightly unscientific, but tenderness in the interaction. So the, the male intermittently tickles the female's fur with its uh, front legs during the entire copulation. There are other solitary bees where the male strokes the antenna of the, male, of the female bee during copulation. And so as opposed to, for example, the mating in birds which often takes a few seconds and it literally looks like well there's some sperm transferred and that's that's all there is it looks at least superficially like 
um, an, an activity that's often um, prolonged for extended periods and involves things like deliberate stimulation of the female by the male. But people simply haven't looked at the hormonal responses um, or, um, well, questions of um, whether there is a, a dopamine hit that even suppresses the fear or the, the, um, the, the, the death that occurs in honeybee mating. But I think we ought to look more thoroughly at, at such things. I would have thought that an insect's mating would be even quicker. Do, you, do we know any reliable predictors of how long copulation is across species? I don't have the numbers except for the bumblebees where we've observed it, of course, hundreds of times in the laboratory, and there it can really last over an hour. Um, in honeybees, it's typically much shorter, and I'm not sure for other insects, but I'm sure there is data on this question out there. And so um, specifically in study systems like there are certain scorpion flies that deliver presents to their females before copulation, and the copulation duration basically correlates with the, the quality of the present. And the, the better the present, the more sperm is also transferred. So there's a direct correlation between the quality of your present and how many um, offspring you may sire. And so I'm sure there is data out there on, on, um, on the duration, but I don't uh, by heart know the numbers. That makes it sound like there might be some sort of dopaminergic reinforcement learning, because if it's indeed pleasurable and the longer it goes, the more pleasurable it is. And that's a direct reward for the quality of your gift. Without that pleasure piece, it doesn't seem like there would be much incentive to make sure your gift is as high quality as possible. I agree, but it's, of course, we have to be clear on the fact that this is hard to prove. But um, mm -hmm. again, I think the, the argument that where we perfectly accept for us and perhaps related animals that it makes perfect evolutionary sense to attach sense of, a sense of pleasure or um, fear, depending on what the situation is, to the setting. And there's a, an awareness of, of these feelings. It takes a slightly convoluted argument to say why that shouldn't be the case for similar situations or settings in animals. So you would again have to assume that what involves these conscious and sentient components in us for some reason should be fully automated in in animals while having while having the same kinds of fitness benefits ultimately. So definitely worth investigating further, I think. The hour-long honeybee copulation is still very surprising to me because even in social primates, where there's a clear evolutionary story of sex being not just for reproduction, but for social bonding, like bonobos are highly sexual, for example, it still doesn't last nearly as long. And we have much longer lifespans. So for an insect, an hour is like a week for us, right? You could say that. So in the case of bumblebees, they're the ones with the hour-long mating. Hmm. Uh, the, the workers and males, oh, sorry, the, the males li live about a month, maybe up to six weeks, but often less. And of course, as a percentage of the entire lifespan, that is a considerably larger fraction than what you just cite in bonobos. Even for the queens that live a year in bumblebees, that's a substantially larger fraction of a total lifespan to spend with copulation. And so indeed, that's an, a, an interesting and perhaps surprising comparison. Across mammals, maybe even across vertebrates in general, usually you see males as larger, more dominant, more aggressive. And there's, again, a pretty standard evolutionary story told here of there's more direct physical competition between males, variability in reproductive success is greater. The females aren't as aggressive. They can sort of be passive and smaller, or even if it's not 
sexual selection for armamentation. It can be ornamentation. So you see this with birds where a lot of males are brightly colored and have huge feathers and the females are kind of drab. But in insects, at, at least in bees and in praying mantises, the story seems more matriarchal. Why is that? Well, so in the social insects, the uh, ants, so the, the hymenopterans, the ants, wasps, and bees, it relates again to the haplodiploidy, where um, the workers and queens have a complete set of chromosomes, whereas the males have only half. The situation is slightly different in termites, which um, have both males and workers engaged in um, colony building and foraging and so on, and they are not haplodiploid. So um, the social insects of the hymenopterans are particularly special indeed in that it's basically fully matriarchal. So the, the, the females do basically everything that matters in colony organization, defense, labor division, and, um, and supplying the colony with food, whereas the males are largely just engaged in, um, well, in, uh, in copulation and, um, and transmitting um, genes to subsequent generations. That makes me think of life history theory and an, maybe another reason that it's surprising to think of emotions existing in insects. So the, the classic life history theory story is that you can have this whole range of reproductive options. So on one end, you have something like fish or insects where you're laying thousands of eggs and many, many of them die, but there's really low investment. That's not like you're parenting them or nurturing them. So it doesn't matter that most of them die as long as enough of them survive that over time, uh, enough genes get passed down. And then mammals tend to take the opposite approach where you have long gestation times, you have lots of parental investment and lots of energy investment, but a fairly high rate of survival. And those strategies, it seems like you can lie anywhere along that whole spectrum. And you, you do see the full range of that across species. But with that increased parental investment, particularly in mammals, that's where you hear this story of that's where you start to get genuine social bonding like emotions you get oxytocin mediated care and so on and anyone on the other extreme of this life history theory spectrum on the on the faster side it seems like alongside the low parental investment is low care and low capacity for emotion and feeling in general that's the stereotype i think but um if you if you look at the the diversity of of um, life pathways across animal species, um, it's not quite so simple. So there are first of all many invertebrates who live very very long. Sea urchins, for example, live up to eighty years. Um, among the social insects that are under debate here, um, some. Stingless bee queens can live for for a decade. Honey bee queens for um, for um, several years, up to seven years, and so they're not necessarily that short in their their lifespan. And also, of course, where one case where in insects you find extensive brood care is in the bees and their relatives, the the um, ants and wasps. So yes, there are many insect species that are both short-lived and just litter their eggs all over the place and the the larvae then um, hatch and have to fend for themselves. But in the social insects, of course, one of their defining features is that they build a nest where they um, care for their brood, where they protect the brood from predator attacks, um, feed it, and um, the brood is is has overlapping generations of life with the adults, so that there are several generations living together. And again, 
while we don't know anything about any kind of emotional attachment or let's say mothers to their daughters, I suspect that this is because we haven't looked properly. So if you, for example, take the case of a bumblebee queen, so they overwinter um, singly and have to found a colony all by themselves at the, the start of the flowering season in spring. And so initially they have to multitask. They both build a wax structure to um, to uh, lay their eggs into. They build honey pots and so on. They have to warm the brood and they have to deliver the food. And then, of course, the first batch of workers will hatch four, five workers, which can then start to help with building the colony. And then as she gets more workers, of course, the queen then resorts entirely to being a cave, um, resorts to being a cave animal that just lays eggs and everyone else does the work. Now, for that queen, and it's, let's say, first batch of workers, every individual matters. And um, so there are threats, of course, to these budding nests because they're vulnerable. They're there's not yet a lot of workers to defend the colony and lots of other animal species are interested in um, honey pots because it's a high nutri high carbohydrate drink in the proteins that come with, from the larvae and so on. I would imagine that to the extent that an attachment to your offspring matters to us and other animals, so... Um, we get anxious at the prospect of um, our children coming to harm, and we get um, obviously very anxious. And indeed, there are um, there is a perspective that they might be lost or something. That anxiety, while it's not pleasant of at the moment, of course, ensures that we avoid that kind of scenario from happening in the first place. And the same logically, at least, should be a fitness example in all animals that look after their brood. I would imagine at least that evolution simply doesn't look kindly about any mother, any parent that basically is indifferent to the loss of their, their offspring, especially in scenarios where this offspring is very extensively looked after and protected and cared for. Now, you might postulate that all this brood care in Hymenoptera is is hardwired, that it's somehow mechanistic, but certainly the argument that there is no brood care, as you might observe in some fish that just drop their eggs left and right and, uh, um, and, and don't care for them, that certainly does not apply. You do definitely hear the argument that something like mourning is unique to social mammals. And, and let's say from parent to child, it's not unique just to mammals. What about in the other direction of mourning the death of a family member or the death of a queen bee? Do you see something like colony-wide shifts in behavior? Yes. So I mean, this is well known by beekeepers that when um, the, the, the queen dies, that there is yet a replacement, that there are all kinds of um, audible um sounds emanating from from the colony that you don't usually hear again the emotional component of this has not been looked at people haven't uh, i guess until recently taken seriously the prospect that there might be um, a kind of psychological stress state in such a scenario so we simply don't know but it's certainly plausible now, in the experiments you described, you were very careful to mention the bees were not harmed here. We were we were gripping them with foam, or it was a fake spider, wasn't a real spider that was attacking them. Is that informed by this realization? Oh, they have something like feelings too, therefore the same research ethics must apply to them? So I have to admit that when we started this study with the crab spiders, we didn't yet have that sort of uh, approach. And so my mind has changed very profoundly over the decades of, of working with bees. 
in the 1980s, 90s, when I first began my work with the bees, um, even the prospect that they might have the capacity to suffer would have been laughed at. But you have to keep, of course, the perspective on context and the, the time at which back then people, neuroscientists working even on primates and cats would quite confidently state, well, they, they don't have consciousness, so there's actually nothing to worry about with doing invasive neuroscientific work on them. That, of course, applied also all the more so at the time to insects. And my perspective has simply changed as a result of decades of work on their intelligence. So we have investigated over time things like their ability to count, to recognize individual human faces or images of them, to solve problems by manipulating objects and to learn such things by observing them from each other. And all this work on learning and memory and cognition basically led to a change in perception where I and colleagues eventually asked, well, if they're that clever, maybe they also feel something. But that's been a dynamic process over the last few years, decades. Um, and I can freely admit that I didn't have that, that insight at the start of my work on bees. How about the ethics of honey? Is, is there any evidence to suggest that when you harvest all of the honey from a hive, that that's something like traumatic to them and they have to frantically work to, to reproduce all, all of the, the honey that they work so hard to produce? It's a good question. Um, I mean, I think there are, of course, there's a huge variation in beekeeping practices and uh, some beekeepers are, are trying their best to be as ethical as possible in honey harvest. But by default, of course, that is a, a process that is at, at least has the potential to be fairly anxiety inducing in the bees because that of course is the precious commodity that they work very hard to secure and which at least in natural settings uh, ensures their survival over bad weather periods or cold periods such as the winter. And so removing all of that from them is, is something that they, well, overtly and very obviously violently resist typically. But of course, the honey can be harvested in various, um, with various methods and of course also in, in various quantities to make it make at least try to ensure that the the harm is minimized but of course as with any kind of agricultural or livestock practice there are huge differences in how people go go about these things and and of course at the industrial end of honey production also in the commercial pollination industry um the there's pretty much no appreciation of the capacity to suffer in animals, but that of course extends to battery chicken and, um, and uh, farm pigs and so on as well. But people simply and with the most ruthless methods, methods try to maximize the commodity that they're selling and um, um, if anything, just pay lip service to some sort of ethical practice, but in insects, they typically do not. So the the um, phenomena that you might have heard about in the press about colony collapse disorder, where um, commercial beekeepers use, lose large numbers of um, beehives under what they say are mysterious circumstances is typically the result of really bad beekeeping practices. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Lars, we've talked a lot about social, emotional, sexual behavior, which is largely where my interest in brain development lie. But most of the book and most of the research in this field in general is more cognitive, as you mentioned. So studies on memory, on learning, on numerical cognition. You want to go over some of the highlights in any of those areas? Yeah, 
Yeah. So when I was a PhD student in the early 90s, people were already aware that bees have to learn some things. So obviously, because they have a home, they have a hive to which they must return. They need a very good spatial memory. And people had explored that for some time already. And people had known that they learned the features of flowers. So their colors, their scents and patterns. Basically, bees have to be careful shoppers in the flower supermarket. They have to be good at identifying those particular flower species that offer the best cost to benefit ratio, learn the features of these flowers, very much like we learn the packaging of a product that we return to in a supermarket. And then of course, once you've identified something that's good, you don't then need to invest more time into um, sampling other things. You just return to the same product because you recognize it, you memorize it. People had known that, but there was also, I guess, an understanding that these are very specialized learning abilities, that bees have to be good at them because that's what they do on a daily basis. But there was a kind of mindset people thought, okay, there's not a kind of flexibility in their learning ability that you, you would explore in other sort of icons of animal intelligence, such as say, corvid birds or primates where you deliberately probe their flexibility by with tasks that they do not on a daily basis encounter in their daily lives. When we did a study back in the early 90s on bees' ability to count, and so the experiment was that we simply um, erected a series of tetrahedral tents on the along the flight path from the hive to the feeding station, and bees just uh, shuttled back and forth between their hive and the feeding station along a number of um, three of these um, pyramids. And then once they learned this, we produced contradictions between the learned distance and the number of landmarks. We either increased the number of landmarks between hive and the feeder, or we reduced it. And when we reduced the number, the bees tended to overshoot the learned distance and fly a longer distance until they've reached the correct number of three. When we increased the number of, um, of landmarks over the same distance, then bees tended to fly, land at a shorter distance from the hive. So indeed, the number of landmarks in this study had an influence on their distance estimation. And that, at the time, I think, surprised people a little bit because that sort of um, task that lies outside what a bee has to learn on its day-to-day -day basis, just where's my hive, how does that flower look, people hadn't anticipated that. But um, this, I guess, laid the foundation for a good number of um, studies where we probed bees' abilities with tasks that had hitherto been only explored um, and sort of classic icons of animal intelligence, such as, for example, string pulling tasks, where um, the task is you put an object visible but out of reach uh, that an animal desires, such as a, a morsel of food. And the animal then has to pull on a string to um, gain access to, to that desirable item. And we built a version of that task in for the bees by putting artificial flowers under a plexiglass screen and attached a string to that artificial flower. So the only way to get to the, the artificial flower, which contained a drop of nectar, was to land at the side of this plexiglass table and pull on the string. And bees were able to learn this just fine. But perhaps even more surprisingly, once one bee had learned it, such an ability very rapidly spreads through an entire colony. So you can observe its spread like in social network analyses of how memes spread in social media. You could see who copies whom and how swiftly does it um, spread to a large fraction of the population. So you have a culture-like phenomenon of a behavioral um, performance that no bee had ever performed before in their evolutionary history. And that's 
not just if they're, say, in the room watching, but even members of the same colony who were isolated from the task and then introduced to it later? No, they have to. So there's no mysterious um, transmission of memories from one individual to another over a distance, such as perhaps um, Rupert Sheldrake might postulate with his um, with his ideas of um, esoteric ideas of how memories spread. They have to observe it. So they either the naive individual has to be next to a string pulling bee. Or they can also learn it by observing another bee mm -hmm. through a glass partition, but they have to be there. The memory doesn't huh. just jump. From I wasn't to... thinking magical memory transfer, but something like the bee who did the task returns to the colony, and then there's something like communication. That's a good question. So you find such communication in the colony in honeybees, but... While this is a very impressive symbolic communication system, the so-called honeybee dance, it's limited in its content. It's limited in the kind of information that is transmitted because that dance language is only about locations where they found food. So what happens is that a successful forager that has discovered a good food source, for example, will return to the colony and can move around in a stereotypic pattern. That's why it's called a dance. So they go through the same motions again and again. And encoded in these motions is the information about the precise direction and the distance to the food. Passively, because the, the um, dancing bee also, of course, bears on her fur the, the, the odor of the, of the flowers. They can also transmit odor information during the dances. But that's basically it. So they can't convey information about wholly new things in this dance language. And that distinguishes, of course, the, the bee language from the human language. We can invent new words for new things in a flash or new words for new activities that haven't ever been there before. The dance language of the bees is, is limited to certain information contents and do not involve um, the, the, let's say, motor patterns to deal with puzzle boxes or string pulling tasks. So in that scenario, the naive individual has to be present at the scene to pick up from her nest mate how to solve the task. Is the use of the word language here to describe the dances metaphorical? Or do people genuinely talk about this the way we talk about language? And maybe it's not as complicated as human language, but it has the same essential features. Yes and no. So it has some of um, some of these features, in that you in that the bees actually use a form of symbols, and that I think is is distinct from how other non-human animals communicate about food sources. So in other animals, you might find that an individual has discovered the bounty of food. Um, generate some sort of calls to um, to um, lure group members to that uh, destination. You also find in in some uh, animal species that there is that that they might go back to their group and then guide the entire group, the social group to the destination and so on. But that of course is relatively unimpressive because it doesn't actually use any kind of um, symbols. What honeybees can do, they come back to the colony and use these symbols, use these movement patterns to inform other individuals and send them to that destination without accompanying them, without guiding them themselves to the known destination. So they can pass on the information through these dance movement patterns using symbols, essentially, to other individuals that then have to decode the information and apply it in spatial and temporal removal from the act of picking it up. The key difference to human language, of course, is in us the infinite versatility where you can easily invent new terms for new, new inventions, new machines for new activities, 
And um, um, so there's, there's an unlimited versatility in human language, whereas this use of symbols in the bees is entirely limited to um, certain types of information. Now, that said, recent findings from James Nye's group have shown that even this dance language is not entirely hardwired. It needs to be learned from conspecifics. And if they don't get to learn it, they'll still display some rudimentary form of this dance, but it's very sloppy in its precision. And they also make consistent mistakes if they haven't had the chance to observe dancing conspecifics to um, to um, entrain them with the correct movement patterns. You also mentioned spatial cognition and memory. And I was reading some old studies on desert ant navigation recently. And there was a whole bunch of experiments that showed that you could disorient them or place them in novel environments. And they, and they had this way of almost geolocation, like they could they could make their way back to the colony. And there was some evidence that the, the polarized light that they're sensing from the sun has a role to play there so they can uh, adjust for, say, time of day and what ways the lights are refracting and so on. Do bees have that as well? Indeed, the polarization compass was first discovered in bees and uh, later in, in ants. And so just to zoom out a little bit, so bees and, and um, other insects use a sun compass to navigate reliably between their home and uh, a, a known destination. And of course, that isn't trivial because unlike a magnetic compass, the kinds of devices that we uh, we can um, use in the store, where the needle always points north, so that's easy. Uh, a sun compass has the potential disadvantage that number one, it only makes sense to use the sun as a as a compass reference if you also know what time of day it is, because the sun is always in a different location depending on the time of day. So you can't use the sun as a compass reference unless you also have an internal clock. And also, the sun is often not visible. So it might be behind clouds, it might be behind the mountaintop, or it's just behind the horizon. It might still be bright daylight, but the sun is not up yet, or has already gone down. What do you do in such a case? And so there is something that insects can do and we can't, and that is to use the polarization pattern of the skylight. So you might all remember from school lessons that light has wave properties in the same way as when you, um, let's say, attach a rope to a wall and swing it up and down, well, or side to side, depending on how you swing the rope, the, the waves travel in a certain direction, they swing in a certain direction. And the same is the case with, with um, natural daylight. And it turns out that the polarization pattern of a skylight, which insects can see and we can't, changes in a predictable manner with the position of the sun. So if you have that ability to see polarized light in the sky dome, you can reconstruct the position of the sun, even if the sun itself is out of sight behind a building or mountaintop and so on. And so this ability to see polarized light supplements the, the, the sun compass under conditions when the sun position itself is not accessible. So it's, it's a remarkable sensory ability in itself, of course, to see polarized light, but to tie it to using the sun compass when you don't have the sun is, is even more wonderful in my thought because it's... It's tying together multiple sensory inputs for navigation and allows you to navigate in a compass system that we don't use at all, even under conditions when the, the key item in that case, the, the sun, is actually not currently accessible. I have a few final rapid fire questions, Lars. They might turn into long answers, and that's okay. okay so I think of three things that come to mind immediately when I think of bees. I think this is the case for most people. We think stinging, honey, black and yellow stripes. 
Let's start with the, the colors. That might be the easiest one. What is it about the stripes? Is that some camouflage or sexual selection? You see it in wasps as well. It's a warning sign. So many insects, not just these, that um, are either stinging or um, or toxic to consume, have these kinds of warning colors. And the idea essentially is that predators that make the averse experience of either getting stung or um, or um, of being poisoned and potentially very sick from eating a poisonous butterfly will subsequently avoid the same kind of nutrition and then stay clear. And of course, to some extent, this even transmits between species. So when you've once been stung by um, a, a colorful bee, then you might subsequently also be wary of wasps that don't necessarily look identical, but similar enough in that they also have a stripy pattern. Now, that said, of course, there's huge variation between um, different bee species and their striping patterns, even sometimes within species. So the um, species Bumbles terrestris, that is a popular um, bumblebee model in Europe, the most populations are black and white and yellow. But um, there are some populations, island populations, which is just black and white, but very conspicuously colored with this sharp boundary between black and white. There are others that are black and red and so on. Um, but yes, essentially, these are warning colors where the notion is that a predator that doesn't necessarily by default avoid these colors, but has an experience once that's uh, sufficiently unpleasant to stay well clear of the same kind of diet in the future. And the warning for stingings is consistent across bees and across wasps, but Everyone learns that wasps can sting you many times. Bees will die after stinging you. Why didn't they evolve in the more wasp-like direction if it's possible to have a stinger that doesn't kill you? So the, the it, it's only the honeybees among the bees definitely die because they have barbed stingers. Um, there are many other species of bees, including bumblebees, that can actually sting you multiple times. And um, because their stings do not have barbs. So you might think that the advantage, that, that there is a disadvantage in the honeybees because that's the last thing they'll ever do. But there is a difference in the amount of venom that is um, actually injected into your body. Because what happens is that with this barbed stinger, the poison gland and actually the, the, the nerve center that controls the poison gland also rips out. So what stays behind is a whole organ that still remains functional. You can actually see the, the gland continuing to pump because it's that nerve center that generates this rhythm also rips out with it, continuing to pump poison even if you've managed to brush the bee off your skin. And that, of course, is beneficial to the rest of the colony, because while that one individual might be um, sacrificed to for uh, as a kind of um, suicide bomber for the rest of the colony, the amount of poison that can be injected into your skin, even if you do respond and brush these, um, these um, suicidal bees um, off your skin, the amount of poison is much greater than, let's say, with bumblebees, where of course, once you respond to the sting and brush her off, uh, she can sting you again, but the, the amount of poison injected into one such um, action is typically much smaller. And lastly, you've mentioned many differences between honeybees and bumblebees, and the obvious one is honey, but bumblebees produce small amounts of honey as well, and that's enough to survive and to feed the larvae. So... Why so much excess honey in honeybees? Well, first of all, there is a difference in colony size. Honeybee colonies are much, much larger with typically tens of thousands of individuals. Bumblebees have a few dozen to maximum a few hundred workers. 
but crucially, they um, bumblebees do typically not survive the winter months. It's only the mated queens that overwinter, but the colony dies. So they don't have to um, generate a huge um, surplus of storage to help a full colony survive the winter. That said, um, in earlier centuries, hunting bumblebee colonies for um, for their nectar was still sort of a popular boys um, kitty um, sort of endeavor because I guess it paired the the sort of dare factor and getting stung with the um, the acquisition of a, a at least a reasonable quantity of sweet things and before you could go to corner stores with your pocket money, of course, um, both bumblebee honey and honeybee honey was the most nutritious energy drink that was to be had out there in nature. So bumblebees generate a little bit of it, just not the kinds of um, surplus storages that will will get you through a winter. This has been amazing, Lars. You're so, so knowledgeable. All right. Uh, Thank you. Is there anything else we missed from the mind of a bee that you want to mention before we close? Well, I mean, I, I think just the the ethical and conservation aspect of this work i think are important so many be many people are now aware that we need to conserve pollinators because they do something useful for us they pollinate our crops and so all breakfast berries without the bee activities tomatoes and so on um so all of these um useful things that bees do um pollinating our garden flowers and so on um, lead us to appreciate that there's a need for their conservation. But that's uh, an angle of utility. It's it's a question of what can they do for us? Aha. Unlike all these other annoying insects like wasps and mosquitoes, the bees do something useful, so let's conserve. And I think that in addition, so I agree that's, that's a good motivation, but I think in addition, the fact that they are most likely thinking and feeling beings, albeit in a very different manner to, to us, also places on us a different kind of obligation to aid with their con, uh, conservation. And if you think about how people relate to other sort of conservation icons like Siberian tigers and panda bears and, and so on, the approach is that we empathize with their plight. We, we think that they these animals must suffer from the deterioration of their habitat, uh, from the fact that they can't find mates because their populations are too thin. And, and that in turn um, makes people appreciate that we need to help them, but it's this empathy factor. And that, of course, does not apply to, to insects such as bees yet because people don't have a sense that there might actually be um, feelings and thinking going on in these these tiny heads so i think there's something useful to be learned and of course the nice thing about bees is that everyone can do something with exotic species like siberian tigers you can't directly actually contribute other than money whereas to the extent that you have access to a garden or even just a balcony on your high-rise building, just planting any kinds of bee-friendly flowers already makes a difference, contributes a useful resource that somewhat limits the competition between um, bees in your area and, and limits the scarcity of food that is the result of increasing urbanization and industrial agriculture so everyone can do a little bit to um to um to feed the bees mow your lawn a little bit less or replace a boring lawn with lovely wildflowers leave a bit of a mess in your garden where solitary bees can find um, nesting places and so on and you've already made a huge contribution to bee conservation you hear that so in addition to going and buying the mind of a bee buy some flowers Thank you very much for your time, Lars. All right. Thank you for this interesting conversation.